This video is sponsored by Audible. A moderator stands in front of six people sitting at a table in a mid-sized white-walled room. The rules of the game are fairly simple, he says. You take turns rolling two virtual dice. The combined number you roll is how many spaces you move forward on the game map. He points to a map on a large screen at the front of the room, which is also displayed on much smaller tablet screens in front of each player. Along the map, there are spaces, the moderator goes on with. Most of them are empty spaces that you just travel across. Some spaces, however, are called fortune spaces, each of which has a number on it. Land on one and your player moves forward the number you initially rolled times the number labeled on the space. For example, if you roll an eight and land on a fortune space labeled with the number two, you move forward 16 more spaces. There are also spaces called regressive spaces. These also have a number. Land on one of these though, you go backwards the number you rolled times the number labeled. Lastly, there are reward spaces. The number labeled on these signifies point values. Land on one of them moving forward, earn the number of points labeled. Land on one of them moving backwards off a regressive space, lose the number of points. The further forward you go on the map, the larger the point values get. Got it? The players nod their heads in agreement. The moderator instructs each player to press start on their screens. Each player's icon then appears on the game map. Player 1, Charles, 2, Sarah, 3, John, 4, Jess, 5, Krista, 6, Sam. Each icon is in a different starting location on the map, giving each player advantages and disadvantages according to their arbitrary player numbers. Charles starts at the front. Okay, now the most important part. How do you win? The moderator goes on with. The player with the most points by the end wins, obviously, but the catch is, the game only ends once everybody decides to stop playing. Meaning the game goes on as long as you continue to play. The map is infinite. You can eat, sleep, and use the restroom during designated times, but otherwise you must be here playing the game. At any point, you may choose to opt out of the game and leave, at which point, however, you lose. You can all choose unanimously to stop at the same time, but the person with the most points at that time still wins. If, however, you do not all choose to stop at the same time, the last person who is still here playing can play as long as they'd like until they've reached however many points they need to win. The moderator pauses and looks at the group of players. Questions? He asks. The players look back at the moderator, then around at each other. They say nothing. Good, let's begin, concludes the moderator. The moderator instructs Charles to go first. He presses the roll button on his screen and rolls a four on one dice and a three on the other. His icon moves forward seven spaces. The rest of the players, in order of front to back, follow suit. They go around and around, each player rolling the dice, getting excited about each collection of points and upset about each loss. The fortune, reward, and regressive spaces are spread out just enough to be uncertain and infrequent, but just close enough to keep each player engaged and on the edge of their seat, hopeful that at any moment they'll jump a massive distance and take the lead, and fearful that at any moment they'll fall back a massive distance and lose everything. By the end of the first day, Charles is in the lead with the most points, then John, Sarah, Jess, Sam, and last, Krista. Two more days go by. All the players are still in. They are all bored and anxious, in a constant back and forth between wanting to leave and stay, resulting in an inertia that keeps them all in the game. Inevitably, tensions have increased with time as players have begun to more tightly associate their identities with their positions in the game. Charles has been in the lead since the start of the game and is holding it over everyone's head, emitting a sense of superiority and importance and eliciting spite from all the other players as they grow increasingly annoyed by him, yet desirous of being in his position. It's John's turn. He rolls a three and a two. He moves forward five spaces, hits an 80x fortune space, moves forward another 400 spaces, and collects 16,200 points, putting him in first. He boasts with pretension and animosity towards the other players, especially Charles. Charles tells him to shut up and sit down. John moves towards Charles and asks, or what? Charles jolts up and gets in John's face and says nothing. John is suddenly frightened, not expecting Charles's reaction. John puts all his effort towards not showing his fear outwardly and pushes Charles away from him. Charles seizes the opportunity to release his pent up energy and boredom and lunges at John, taking him to the floor, pinning him to the ground in a position that partly chokes John. The moderator watches as they struggle. Only after John loosens out of Charles' grip and throws several punches does the moderator finally break it up. After being separated and resettled, John and Charles return to their seats, boiling with tension, nerves, and anger. At this point, Krista announces her disinterest in the game and her intention to leave. She's had more than enough. Charles, John, and Jess ridicule her as she leaves. Sam and Sarah observe quietly. They also consider leaving, but fear being ridiculed and feeling like quitters. They decide to stay and see it through. After all, how long could a game like this even go on? 
The game goes on for an absurd length of more time. It's the seventh day now. Sam is now left after suddenly and strangely realizing on the fifth day that he no longer had any idea why they were even playing in the first place. He doesn't announce this realization though and just quietly gets up and leaves. Him and Krista leaving has only reinforced the remaining player's justification for staying now that the end game appears that much closer. It's not about winning the game anymore, but merely about outlasting the other players and proving their superiority of endurance and ability. The game is completely random, yet somehow, all the remaining players have made it about themselves. On the eighth day, Charles is back in the lead. John is in second, then Sarah, and last, Jess. It's Charles's turn. He rolls a six and a one. He moves forward seven spaces onto a regressive space labeled 100X. He then moves backwards 700 spaces and loses 900,218 points, moving him from first place to last place in a single roll. Wait, hold on, Charles erupts to the moderator. I've been in the lead for almost the whole game and just like that, I'm last now? How is that fair? It's random, it's been like that the whole time, replies the moderator. Yeah, well I think we should change the rules. Like if you're in the lead long enough, you should get extra points, or if you're in last long enough, you should lose points, or something like that, argues Charles. You cannot change the rules of the game, replies the moderator. Charles pounds his tablet on the table. But what's the point of this stupid game anyway? He shouts at the moderator. To win, replies the moderator. Yeah, but win what? Asks Charles. The game. The moderator matter-of-factly replies. What do you mean the game? I mean, what do you win by winning the game? Charles goes on with. Nothing, replies the moderator. The whole group pauses for a moment, as if suddenly stricken with the collective realization that they had been duped into spending all this time playing a game without even knowing why or how they got there. One by one, all the players decide to opt out. They get up from their seats and walk towards the exit of the room. Just as they are about to reach the exit door, John stops and says, Actually, I mean, I made it this far and I'm in the lead now. I'm not losing if everyone's just leaving. He laughs to himself, turns around, and goes back to his seat to win. The other players stop and watch him. If you're not leaving, neither am I, says Charles. He then returns to his seat. Then Jess, then Sarah. John, now back at his seat with the rest of the group, presses the roll button for his turn. A large screen that has John, Charles, Jess, Sarah, and the moderator on it glitches into nothingness. An individual named Steely, who ordered the stop, sits at the head of a meeting room table with a group of software engineers, all dressed in similar white uniforms. Who was lead coder on this one? Steely asks the group. There's a brief pause in the room, and then an engineer nervously speaks up. That was me, sir. How the hell did you fix the realization problem for four of the personality types? Steely asks. I just uh, adjusted their incentive algorithms to skew more towards self-esteem rather than rationality, answers the engineer. Theoretically, when we extrapolate them out across billions of character iterations in the full simulation, they should just keep playing forever. They just want to win. Brilliant, Steely exclaims. Thank you, sir, replies the engineer. Let's try skewing Krista and Sam's algorithms more to keep them in a little longer, and try to make the whole thing a little less bleak, especially if they're just gonna keep playing forever. It's entertaining, but you know, we need consumers to feel good. Nobody wants to buy a simulated world where everyone is just willing to suffer for no reason. The engineer at the front of the room makes a couple adjustments on a small tablet screen, according to Steely's instruction. He adjusts Krista and Sam's algorithms, and then applies a new variable to the whole group. The main display screen loads up again. The game moderator appears and six players render into seats at a table in a mid-sized, white-walled room. The moderator looks at them and says, The rules of the game are fairly simple. You take turns rolling two virtual dice. The combined number you roll is how many spaces you move forward on the game map. This video was sponsored by Audible. Audible has the world's largest collection of audiobooks with titles from nearly all genres, professionally voiced by actors, authors, and speakers like Dion Graham, Mel Robbins, and Will Wheaton, to name a couple. Audible has bestsellers, classic fiction, philosophy, business, self-improvement, memoirs, and more, covering just about any area of interest. Currently, Audible members get more than ever with three titles every month, including one audiobook and two Audible originals that you can't hear anywhere else. Audible members also get free access to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post, as well as unlimited access to more than 100 audio-guided fitness and meditation programs, all delivered daily through Audible's app. Whether it's during a commute, at the gym, on a walk, or anywhere, the Audible app can be accessed from any device, picking up right where you left off, making audio learning and entertainment easy and convenient. 
Audible also offers free audiobook exchanges, credits that you can roll over for a year, and a library that you can keep forever, even if you cancel. Visit audible.com slash pursuit of wonder or text pursuit of wonder to 500-500 and you can start listening today with a 30-day trial and your first audiobook plus two Audible originals for free. If you're interested in science fiction, they have plenty of great titles including classics by Aldous Huxley, Isaac Asimov, Frank Herbert, Kurt Vonnegut, and many more. One title in particular worth checking out if you have not already is Player Piano by Kurt Vonnegut. Player Piano was Vonnegut's first novel written in 1952, however the ideas and topics in the novel are arguably more relevant now than ever. Set in a dystopian-like future, Vonnegut explores the relationship between technological automation, economic efficiency, and the human need for a sense of purpose. The story is frighteningly close to reality now, with the implications of AI and job automation only becoming more relevant, making the novel a fascinating time capsule of humanity's entrance into modern technology. Again, if you're interested, visit audible.com slash pursuit of wonder or text pursuit of wonder to 500-500 and explore all the stories and information Audible has to offer.